I'm Parson Michael Maui, and this is Dharma Talks from Sacred Ground. Reflections and meditations brought to you from the Sacred Ground Community Church and Sangha. Today's Dharma Talk, a memorial for Thich Nhat Hanh, was originally shared on January 23rd, 2022. Thank you, Ms. Ali. I'm reminded um, you know I have a big stack of Thich Nhat Hanh books here you know more and more and and uh, I'll actually this is just <laughs> this is a fraction of of the Thich Nhat Hanh books we own but um, I'll get to that later but it's kind of amazing in a way how it simply comes down to breathing in and out, moving your arms and being aware. How is that possibly related to being what is, you know, the Dalai Lama is probably the first voice of Buddhism in the West, the, the second leading voice of Buddhism in the West, um, one of the leading peace activists of the last century in this one. Um, one of the most positively influential people on the planet. I'm reminded of we went to our first mindfulness retreat with our eldest daughter back in the 90s. And then we went to a number of week-long retreats in the early 2000s. And at one of those, I was there with, uh, we were there with our other children as they were born and, and, and with some friends. And I remember being at this retreat with my friend John and uh, we came out of the Dharma talk with Thich Nhat Hanh. And we got the really good seats because we had little kids, so you get to sit up front. Um, I always felt a little guilty about that, but uh, so so we, we get to sit up front. And and um, <clears throat> I think the first hour long talk, Thich Nhat Hanh basically talked about breathing. And a lot of the retreat is silent, but there's different periods where you're, you know, you're welcome to have a chat with someone. And so John and I were talking, I'm like, and John's like, he and I were like, that's it? <laughs> like this, we we came to Massachusetts from Ohio for this, to some guy to tell us to breathe in and breathe out. And uh, the short answer is yes. <laughs> that's the short answer, presence. being here. So incredibly simple and so challenging. D.T. Suzuki was a Zen Buddhist teacher from Japan. Um, well known in the early to mid 1900s. And he said that when a truly great teacher dies, there is typically a shift that happens. And the shift that occurs is from a focus on the teachings to a focus on the teacher. And he gave as an example of that um, what happened with the Buddha 
and how it became this veneration of Shakyamuni after his death. And he also gave the example of Jesus, where all of a sudden the focus becomes on the teacher and people are attending far less to the teachings. We want to honor Thich Nhat Hanh, the teacher and the man. And this particular service is a memorial to that wonderful, incredible human being who walked this planet. And at the same time, I strongly believe And he's said it in a number of different ways that the best way we can honor him is through the teachings. Listening to the teachings, taking them to a deeper level within ourselves, and in whatever ways are appropriate for us, sharing them with others. When we posted that we were having this special service, um, there were a lot more people that we don't know who expressed an interest and may be watching on Facebook Live right now or may watch this recording on Facebook or YouTube later. Why? Because a 95 year old who a week ago, though he could not speak because of his uh, stroke years earlier, was breathing in and out in his home country of Vietnam. is not breathing in and out in that manifestation anymore. But I haven't really gotten to why. Why do we have the interest? Because Thich Nhat Hanh, known as Thai, has touched you. Has influenced you. Has played some role, big or small, in making you a little bit different or perhaps a lot different than you otherwise would be. At one of those retreats where we were sitting up near the front with our little kiddos, Thich Nhat Hanh spoke, and if I have the recording, I don't know where it is here at home. Um, maybe it's online somewhere, but I'll paraphrase what he said as I remember it. He said, there will come a day when you will either hear on TV or read in the newspaper or see on the internet that Thich Nhat Hanh has died. And I will never forget what he next said. You will hear that Thich Nhat Hanh has died. Don't believe it.
He said, for I continue in you. I will not die. He said, I will continue in so many manifestations. As I'm sitting here, I can see our friend Carol. And her partner Chris in this last year died. And I know that he continues in me and Ollie and Carol and so many others. About 10 years after my father's death, my friend Eric said to me, and it was one of the sweetest things a fellow human has said to me. He said, wow, Michael, it's been 10 years since your dad passed? That's so hard to believe. And then he paused and he said, I think it seems so hard to believe because your dad continues so much in you. Thich Nhat Hanh offers five mindfulness trainings, which are part of that grounding of sacred ground. And part of the first mindfulness training reads like this. Seeing that harmful actions arise from anger, fear, greed, and intolerance, which in turn come from dualistic and discriminative thinking, I am committed to cultivating openness, non-discrimination, and non-attachment. In order to transform violence, fanaticism, and dogmatism within myself and in the world. Many of us know that harmful actions arrive from craving, anger, jealousy, fear. But it's harder to know, at least for me, that so much harm comes from our dualistic and discriminative thinking. Almost all of us have our so-called enemies. People who either at a global level or at a personal level have seemed to have caused harm to us. We're not separate. In probably Thich Nhat Hanh's most famous poem, Call Me By My True Names, he speaks of being, uh, to go back, he and the monks and nuns did a lot of work for the boat people who were trying to leave Vietnam. And he got word one day of a young girl who was raped and then jumped overboard and committed suicide. And in this poem, he says, 
he is that little girl. He is not separate. That's a very, very difficult thing to accept when we see the pain and suffering in our world. To allow ourselves to feel, especially those of us who, many of us who are in comfort despite others' pain. But in that poem, Thich Nhat Hanh says something else which I find even more challenging. He says that he too is the rapist. He says that if he had been raised as that boy and then young man, if he had had his experiences, he too may have done the same things. I guess that's one of the difficult gifts that Thich Nhat Hanh has been giving me for these decades. This challenge. I woke up this morning and I, I don't do it every day, but I said to myself, before I open my eyes, I sometimes do this. This is called a gatha, a little prayer. Waking up this morning, I smile. 24 brand new hours are before me. I vow to live each moment fully and to look at all beings with the eyes of compassion. Those are Thich Nhat Hanh's words. Our daughter, when she was a younger teen, she took those words, she wrote them out by hand, and then she taped them up on her ceiling so that every morning through those challenging early teen years, every morning when she woke up, Thich Nhat Hanh invited her to say, waking up this morning, I smile. 24 brand new hours are before me. I vow to live each moment fully and to look at all beings with eyes of compassion. I do not know how many times I have woken up in the morning and made that vow, but I can tell you this. <laughs> I have not yet kept the vow for 24 hours. <laughs> I haven't managed it yet. I haven't managed to look at all beings with eyes of compassion for 24 hours. But I'll tell you what. I hope to get up tomorrow morning and say the vow. And try again. We need those North Stars. We don't necessarily make it to the North Star, but we know where we're trying to get to. <laughs> and what's beautiful and challenging is 
and then we can go back to DT Suzuki. Thich Nhat Hanh is just a man. Just some guy born in, I think, 26, year before my dad. Just some guy. And he's not perfect. <laughs> but he was further along than some of us. <laughs> but maybe we could keep moving further along. Maybe we can remember that we are the earth. Maybe we can remember that we are not separate. Maybe we can remember whether it's Buddhism and Christianity or Sufism and Judaism or anything else. Maybe we can remember that we can draw from our roots, we can draw from our traditions and move toward what waters worthy and beneficial seeds in ourselves and each other in our environments. And I know I've touched it many times, just for a second. Present moment, wonderful moment. I mentioned my dad earlier. My dad died of cancer, and over those months, as he was dying, I would sometimes be up there with my mom, with my siblings. Sometimes my dad was asleep, sometimes he was awake, and we were all sitting together. And I didn't say it aloud, but I said it in my brain. Dwelling in this present moment. And this is a wonderful moment. Wow. What a gift. What a gift, even in that harrowing time, to recognize how wonderful it was to be there in our love for each other. I'm not 100% sure on this, but I think my first contact with Thich Nhat Hanh came in a Borders bookstore at the corner of Henderson and Kenny Road in Columbus, Ohio. I was there with my friend Mark, and I would, was already reading Tibetan Buddhist stuff, uh, the Tibetan Book of Living and Dying, which we're actually going to draw from here in a couple of minutes. And um, so I knew some Buddhist stuff and was looking at kind of the spirituality section, had been involved in spiritual stuff for a long, long time. And I found this book. Let's see if I have it here. Oh, I think it fell down. Just one second. I found this book, Pieces Every Step. And I picked it up off the shelf, and my buddy Mark and I are standing there, and I just opened it at random. I started reading. Shall I? I will. When we do not trouble ourselves about whether or not something is a work of art, if we just act in each moment with composure and mindfulness, each minute of our life is a work of art. Even when we are not painting or writing, we are still creating. Kept opening it. There's a term in Buddhist psychology that can be translated as internal formations, fetters, or knots. When we have a sensory input, depending on how we receive it, a knot may be tied in us. When someone speaks unkindly to us, if we understand the reason and do not take his or her words to heart, we will not feel irritated at all, and no knot will be tied. But if we do not understand why we were spoken to that way, and we become irritated, a knot will be tied in us. The absence of clear understanding is the basis for every knot. And I kept opening it again and again, and I kept finding stuff like that. Well, I bought the book. 
And I said, after I read it, I feel like, it feels like to me, based on my limited concepts and how I view the world, I feel like I'm reading what Jesus would say if he were here today. And then a few years later, a Tibetan Buddhist teacher wrote of Thich Nhat Hanh. Thich Nhat Hanh writes, I, I may not have the exact words, but essentially, Thich Nhat Hanh writes with the voice of the Buddha. And then, books started coming out like, and mine are pretty beat up, Going Home, Jesus and Buddha's Brothers, or before that, I think, Living Buddha, Living Christ. And I'm like, oh my goodness. I've been mixing and melding traditions for a long time, and all of a sudden I've got this guy telling me, yeah, two roots. How wonderful. And I've had this lifelong concern about our planet, and of course with climate change it's more intense. And then I see his books like Love Letter to the Earth. I spoke of my dad. I could not exist without that man. And he had his faults and his foibles, but he was a pretty, pretty good guy. And he had his own blue collar wisdom, I'd say. And in 2009, we decided, Ollie and I, we would try this experiment. What happens if we put together the Buddhism and the Christianity and the earth-centered spirituality the way Ty said? And with ebbs and flows, that experiment has continued. In 2014, I went to seminary full-time. I got a Master of Divinity degree. And I told you I'm a slow learner. <laughs> I think I just realized today, or maybe last night as I was thinking about this service, there's no way I would have gone to seminary without Thich Nhat Hanh. My daughter would not have those words up on her ceiling without Thich Nhat Hanh. There may be some of you out there who just heard of Thich Nhat Hanh and this guy who died and well, oh, check this thing out, this video that's on the internet here. But probably most of you have had some contact with him. And there's layers and layers. There's a book that just came out about the friendship between Thich Nhat Hanh and Dr. Martin Luther King. And Ty said how he had devoted his life after his friend's death, his friend's assassination, to continuing that work of building the beloved community. I hold an aspiration that 10 years from now, more people will know about Thich Nhat Hanh than do today. That in the year 2070, Thai will be more popular than he is in 2040.
He's not the only worthy teacher, but he's one of them. My friend Joseph said, one of the things he likes is, I'm always coming up with these different practices. So let me just give you that practice. If you have a TikTok on book or two or three or 40, <laughs> put them out around your house. Put one in the bathroom. And then if you want, read it from cover to cover, if you haven't, or read it again. And I also encourage writing notes in the margins. You, some people know that's one of my things. But also, I encourage you. Just open it at random, creating true peace. From a very young age, I had a strong desire to put the Buddha's teachings into practice in order to improve the lives of people around me, especially those of the poor peasants. Many monks, including myself, had a deep desire to bring Buddhism into every walk of life. For us, taking action according to the principles of what I called engaged Buddhism, right action, based in compassion, was the answer. Love letter to the earth. Before eating, we may like to take a moment to reflect on our food. In the five contemplations, we vow to eat in a way that preserves our compassion and reduces the suffering of living beings. Someone without compassion cannot be happy because they're cut off from others and can't relate to the world. We need to have compassion too for the earth, our mother. Thich Nhat Hanh, true love. When you breathe in, you recognize at that moment that this is an in-breath. When you breathe out, you're aware of the fact that this is an out-breath. Recognizing what is there in the present moment is attention. This is the energy of mindfulness. So then with this mantra, which he had explained earlier, you're going to practice recognizing the presence of the person you love. And the mantra is, Dear one, I know that you are there and it makes me very happy. I've just been opening these at random, but I cannot think of a better way to end this talk than to say to our beloved teacher, Thich Nhat Hanh. Dear one, I know, we know, that you are here. And it makes us very happy. I'll invite the bell to sound. And I'll speak a couple more words before. Pass it on to Ollie. Once again, enjoy the sound of the bell.
I'm a person who loves words and I try to be careful with words. And we say that sacred ground, community church and Sangha is grounded by Thich Nhat Hanh's teachings. And what that means to me is that serves as a fundamental framework, a grounding for us. But what that also means is that we're not limited to Thich Nhat Hanh's teachings. I shared from the Hebrew Bible today. As long as those teachings fit with that grounding. And over the years, we've had teachings and practices from Jewish, Hindu, Muslim tradition as part of our services and also from other forms of Buddhism. I've never heard Thich Nhat Hanh speak of the Pawa practice. It's a Tibetan Buddhist practice, sometimes done as a practice of healing, but more commonly done for the dying and those who have died. I haven't heard Thai speak of this practice. I knew of this practice before I knew of Thai's teachings. But it is not in conflict with Thich Nhat Hanh's teachings. It is befitting. And as he said, with the multiple roots, it is, I think, I hope, enriching. So Ali will lead us in the Tibetan Buddhist Pawa practice that we will offer for our friend and our teacher, Thich Nhat Hanh. So this is the practice we do. Um, like Michael said, a Tibet, Tibetan Buddhist practice we do for people that have passed on and um, doing this practice for years. Uh, just this week, a dear friend of ours passed. Um, and I just talked to her son two nights ago about this practice. Uh, and uh, this friend uh, was a Sufi. And uh, this practice can do with people of any religions. Um, just a way of sending them to the great sacred. Um, so what I'd like you to do, if you just want to get in a comfortable position, you think about where you, you want your hands to be in your lap, on your chest. Uh, in prayer position, just place them into your body. You want to close your eyes and just start breathing again. In and out. Now into your mind. We're going to envision today Thich Nhat Hanh, Thai. Envision his spirit. We are going to envision his spirit going to the sacred. And since he was a Buddhist monk, you can envision him going into the heart of the Buddha. You can envision him going into the sacred light. You choose. Now you just see his spirit. Going into that sacredness. I'm going to imagine the sacred light. While you're imagining his spirit, his goodness, his compassionate spirit going to the light. You're also going to imagine any pain or suffering that he still had in him as leaving him, leaving his spirit. Can just float away. You float down as he floats up towards that light. We're just going to spend a minute here with all of us that are here gathered today, sending Thai spirit 
to the light. Sending him back to the great sacred. So just a few moments of silence. Help you do that while breathing and honoring time. Another big breath in and out together. Warm, loving thoughts to this wonderful, gentle monk and profound teacher. Peace. Amen. Mm. So now we're going to do, um, have another time for sharing. So if anything has come up um, in you, and I know there's some things on Facebook that people shared before that I'm going to share here. But again, if you would like to, I think somebody had raised their hand in, I don't see it raised now in our uh, Zoom, but if you want to type up anything in the chat, you want to raise your hand and we can put you um over here as a panel panelist, you want to share anything. I'm going to go ahead and share what a couple of people have shared on Facebook um, here. Um, let's see. So Michael shared, there is the mud and there is the lotus that grows out of the mud. We need the mud in order to make the lotus. This suggests to me that the most beautiful of manifestations of our flowering nature can arise from the deepest of struggles. I imagine Ty exploring mindfulness in the midst of conflict and war in his homeland. Through the mud, was, though the mud was sick, thick, he arose to bloom before the world. I have another one to, from Wang Di. To me, he embodies his teachings with his daily practice as opposed to many teachers, preachers, lamas do the teaching as do I say, not as I do. And then Katrina, Katarina, compassion springs from the heart as pure, refreshing water, healing the wounds of life. Mm. So we'll give a minute, put Michael back on here too. Um, if anybody else wants to share any more, uh, and then we're going to go on to our joys and concern and joys and concerns. And if you have not yet shared or would like to share again, um, you're welcome to via the uh, comments on Facebook or Zoom or. Uh, if you'd like to be a panelist on Zoom and share that way. And we also invite people who may be watching this as a recording on YouTube or on our Facebook page, you're welcome to write your additional comments that um, others can see uh, as, you, as you see the video. Um, we'll take a couple of minutes for, we usually share joys and concerns, and I will say this is an extended service. We usually have a hour-long service, and we're we're running a lot longer today as a special memorial service. But we are moving toward the closing. I want to share a few closing words of Ty before we go as well. But um, we're going to have our joys and concerns, a closing prayer, and a closing reading. Uh, some words that I feel are perhaps especially helpful to us from Thich Nhat Hanh at this difficult time on our planet. Um, 
But we'll take a moment here for if anyone would like to share any joys or concerns. And again, you can share that in the comments as well. I'll share a, uh, as Ollie said, a friend of ours, uh, her name's Hillel, uh, passed this week. And again, an incredible spirit. And we wish her well on her journey and Special prayers, especially for, for her, her son, Ted. I also give thanks for this opportunity. Um, I'm oftentimes critical of uh, social media and technology. Um, but I think there's a real invitation to all of us of how can we utilize these things in beneficial ways. And there have been so many, you might want to look around, there's so many other uh, uh, broadcasts about Thich Nhat Hanh right now, including um, uh, where he is in Vietnam and good that is coming through the internet. Great good. So I'm, I'm thankful for that as well. So, um, uh, just I, I don't see anything else here on Facebook right now. Michael, I just want to mention that to you. So, oh, wait. Um, oh, I do. So, Ka, um, Katarina says, please wrap your healing cloak and comfort around those who have left too soon. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. We give thanks for this life. For the opportunity to learn worthy teachings. We give thanks to Thich Nhat Hanh, Thai, we ask you Thai to continue to help us. You have left us with many words, many videos, many opportunities to continue learning from you. Thank you for how you have touched so many of us. It is understandable for us to feel sad and shed tears. But we ask you to keep reminding us that you have not died.
that you are here. And that we can sit down and learn more from you anytime. You are always available. In books and YouTube videos, but also in our hearts and spirits. We pray that all this adds to what's beneficial for all the world. Peace and amen. Ollie will have our announcements and then I will have our Ollie will have our announcements and then I will have our our closing words of Thich Nhat Han for our difficult and challenging times. And I found this last night around midnight and it felt like, oh, okay, Ty, <laughs> I'll read this. <laughs> so that's what I'll close with here in a, in a moment after our announcements. Again, thank you so much for joining us and, uh, uh, to be able to come together it's really, really um, meaningful and important to me and hopefully for others too. Um, just an announcement. If you want to learn more about us, you can go to the holynow.org. Um, we have lots there, including our calendar of events. Uh, and like Michael mentioned, we are way beyond the normal time. We usually have one hour service. And we knew it was going to be about an hour and a half, but it's gone a little bit longer. Uh, actually, in, in, typical of uh, uh, Thich Nhat Hanh and there, um, there we, we weren't rushing <laughs> through it, uh, to hopefully doing things mindfully. But um, we will be meeting again next Sunday um, on January 30th. And then uh, about every other Sunday we meet. Um, but again, it's on the holynow.org or calendar. So it would be February 13th and 27th. Then we were, going to, we were going to have a special Ash Wednesday service on March 2nd, and that'll be on Wednesday, uh, an evening service. Um, and then we'll have um, March 13th and 27th, and then we will have a Palm Sunday service and an Easter service. So we're going to be, we are going to be meeting quite a bit uh, during, during Lent. Um, so if you want to learn more, you can go there. All of our old services are on our, our Facebook page. Uh, and then some of the services are on our YouTube page, Sacred Ground. Um, so you can go there to find out different things we've been doing. Um, you can go to theholynow.org uh, to support us uh, and to learn more. You also may message us uh, and get on our email list if you want to uh, know about other things that are happening because more things will be happening uh, as spring is, will be arriving here in a few months. <laughs> Although right now it is snowing beautifully here in Columbus, Ohio, which actually Michael and I enjoy. So I'm going to give it back to Michael. Again, thanks for joining us. And um, I give it back to him for the last closing words from Ty. Thank you, Ollie. Um, <clears throat> I, I just a little joke. Uh, I some you know his name is Tick Not Han, and I I've sometimes said Tick Not as in the clock doesn't quite work. Tick Not, you know. And so uh, I was thinking of that when we heard here in Ohio on January twenty first, we learned that Ty had died on January twenty second because it was already midnight in Vietnam and it was still the 21st here. And I thought, oh my gosh, that's so perfect of Thich Nhat Han messing with our understanding of time and <laughs> inviting us into presence. So just thought I'd share that little one. And again, the, the, the mystic in me, um, Last night I'm looking through readings and of course there's a thousand, you know, this is why we're two hours, right? Because we could have gone 12 hours. Um, and 
we hope we've done uh, honor to Ty, but I felt last night, Ollie had gone to bed and I was still looking at things and just kind of thumbing through it. And I read this and I thought, whew, this feels like maybe what some of us need to hear. You know, I mentioned we're in such difficult times, right? You know, the pandemic with Omicron and divisions in the nation and climate change and all the rest. And uh, so I will invite the bell to sound. And then the final words today will be from our teacher Thich Nhat Hanh from his book, The Heart of the Buddhist Teaching. Thank you so much for joining us. And I hope some of you um, will find, I hope all of us will find ways to continue to manifest that Thich Nhat Hanh within us. If this is an appropriate way for you, great. There's other Thich Nhat Hanh sanghas out there. And of course, there's other groups with other foci, but encourage you to keep watering those beneficial seeds. Ty writes, someone asked me, aren't you worried about the state of the world? I allowed myself to breathe. And then I said, what is most important is not to allow your anxiety about what happens in the world to fill your heart. If your heart is filled with anxiety, you will get sick and you will not be able to help. There are wars, big and small, in many places, and that can cause us to lose our peace. Anxiety is the illness of our age. We worry about ourselves, our family, our friends, our work, and the state of the world. If we allow worry to fill our hearts, sooner or later we will get sick. Yes, there is tremendous suffering all over the world, but knowing this need not paralyze us. If we practice mindful breathing, mindful walking, mindful sitting and working in mindfulness, we try our best to help and we can have peace in our heart. Worrying does not accomplish anything. Even if you worry 20 times more, it will not change the situation in the world. In fact, your anxiety will only make things worse. Even though things are not as we would like, we can still be content, knowing we are trying our best and will continue to do so. If we don't know how to breathe, smile, and live every moment of our life deeply, we will never be able to help anyone. I am happy in the present moment. I do not ask for anything else. I do not expect any additional happiness or conditions that will bring about more happiness. The most important practice is aimlessness, not running after things, not grasping. We who have been fortunate enough to encounter the practice of mindfulness have a responsibility to bring peace and joy into our own lives, even though not everything in our body, mind, or environment is exactly as we would like. Without happiness, we cannot be a refuge for ourselves or others. Ask yourself, what am I waiting for to make me happy? Why am I not happy right now? My only desire is to help you see this. 
How can we bring the practice of mindfulness to the widest spectrum of society? How can we give birth to the greatest number of people who are happy and who know how to teach the art of mindful living to others? The numbers of people who create violence is very great, while the numbers of people who know how to breathe and create happiness is very small. Every day gives us a wonderful opportunity to be happy ourselves and to become a place of refuge for others. We don't need to become anything. We don't need to perform some particular act. We only need to be happy in the present moment and we can be of service for those we love and to our whole society. Aimlessness is stopping and realizing the happiness that is already available. If someone asks us how long he has to practice in order to be happy, we can tell him that he can be happy right now. The practice of apranahita, aimlessness, is the practice of freedom. That teaching came to us from Thich Nhat Hanh's The Heart of the Buddha's Teaching. Blessings as we go forward. May we look with compassionate eyes. May we experience the wonder of the present moment. May we help to bring peace and justice and joy to other people, to our earth, to this world. We hope you can join us again next Sunday. Peace and amen, and amen.